begin. Let me welcome everyone. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a couple of great guests for a really, really interesting proposal to talk about. Uh, we have, for the past nearly seven years, been exploring quite a few ways to reform higher education. Everything from reforming finances to pedagogy to hiring to uh, curricula. What's interesting here today is two gentlemen have proposed a really new framework that manages to reform both higher education and high school and the job market at the same time. They call it the big blur. And this comes from an outfit called Jobs for the Future, which I think we'll hear about in a little bit. So let me just take turns, bring up each of the authors right now. Um, and let me start with Joel, who is very kindly joining us from a busy airport. Uh, we really appreciate him making the time. And let's see if he comes through. Hello, Joel Vargas. Hey, Brian. Thanks for having uh, me very, here. Good to oh, see you. Oh, my pleasure. Very, very good to see you. Uh, Joel, um, besides being trapped in an airport, um, let, let me ask, what are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the big projects and the big uh, services or the big ideas for you? Well, you mentioned one of them. Um, it's a big one of ours. And it, it's really Kyle, who you're going to bring up momentarily, I know, and I, along with the team at JFF, are really going to be focused on doing everything we can to see if we can blur the lines between what we know traditionally as a traditional high school, uh, the transition into and through college, and the relationship, the integration of those two things with career and, and work. Um, we're proposing an idea called the Big Blur. Um, it's inspired by um, a lot of um, innovative practitioners and policymakers out in the field who I think have um, tried to bl um, blur the boundaries between those systems on their own in sort of like in spite mm. of the systems mm. that they confronted. Mm. They're very constrained. But we think that they, if you kind of um, take stock of them, and maybe coalesce them, which is one of the things we'll be doing this year. We think there may be more than meets the eye. They may be, they may constitute actually a growing movement that we think yeah. could tip the systems yeah. eventually. Um, yeah. And I don't know, I would just want to um, have people here imagine when we talk about the big blur, what the kind of radical change we're, we're seeking and calling for. Um, they would manifest it in some ways, if the systems were built this way, these little programs wouldn't be needed anymore. So what we, you know, Kyle and I propose along with co-authors is what if you imagined the system, suspend your disbelief about the current, you know, high school and, and college systems. What if we design learning environments that were really tailored to the needs of older adolescents, roughly 16 to 20 year olds. And like me and I would say, why don't we create institutions, for example, that encompass grades 11 through 14. And given the economic demands that we have, uh, if you want a good job, you need some kind of post-secondary credential now. So these, uh, going through these institutions, you would graduate with a post-secondary credential that has labor market value. That would be the new high school diploma. That would be the default. And we know it would have value because they would be co-designed with regional employers, you know, who would um, help, um, educators make sure that what they were doing was aligned with the needs of, of industry. They would actually also um, require that every student would have some kind of internship or other work-based learning experience as a part of that education. Um, and they would also prepare students, frankly, um, probably even better than our systems do now for further education, should they wanna do that. There would be no dead end here. It opens doors, not closes them, is, is how uh, we've envisioned it. Last thing I'll say is, if you can imagine that, then imagine the systems that would be needed, financing, accountability, governance, um, uh, let's say uh, uh, staff credentialing regimes, even the way we think of a teacher or a professor, like suspend that and sort of think of like, what would it take to be an instructor in such an environment um, focused on, on older adolescents? And um, those are the kinds of policy changes that we're gonna be working with national advocacy organizations uh, in key states to try to advance uh, this vision. So um, I hope I've laid out a, an interesting provocation here for discussion, but I know Kyle may have some things to add here too. Well, he, he will. And uh, so I, I, I love that you answered my question by saying that you're gonna be working on this really intensely for the next year, it sounds like. We are, we have to you know, probably, uh, 
we have to we have to show some progress here in the next year to ourselves to see if we can you know make some step changes um as i think it i think it's a key moment i understand excellent excellent well hang on a second let me bring up uh, your colleague so he can join us as well and we have kyle hello hey brian good to see you sir good uh, to see you you heard the question. What are you going to be working on for the next year? Are you going to be the, the same thing with uh, Joel? Uh, well, you know, we're kind of tied at the hip on this thing. And we have a really awesome uh, team uh, at JFF that is really helping to support this. And so I could talk a little bit about some of the tactical work that's in front of us in the coming year. Um, and it's really centered on building out some of these ideas as we think about what would it really look like to integrate work and learning at a fundamental level. and established Ooh. systems so that they're really oriented to create a career navigation approach that supports not just lifelong learning, but what I would call life-wide learning by design. Mm -hmm. um, and just to be really sharp and clear on this, like we're not talking about another high school reform initiative. Uh, like this is really trying to fundamentally dismantle and reimagine the way systems could really work um, at a truly uh, in a truly different way. We haven't created a new type of educational institution in, in what, 100 years, maybe more? Um, so how are we going get, to get to some of these things that Joel's talking about? So one of the things that we're going to be starting to put in motion pretty soon, Brian, um, is starting to figure out how do we effectively network innovative leaders and practitioners to who are undertaking some of these Ooh. approaches, creating pilots, creating signaling systems about things that might work mm -hmm. to really mm -hmm. share and cultivate a base of knowledge and experience and who can collectively advocate for and support systems change along the lines that we articulate in the big blur. Um, we'd like to be putting forward uh, what we're calling the Big Blur Employer Summit. Um, so how do we also discreetly convene employers in this space? Large Fortune 1000, 500 companies, but also small and medium-sized employers who are really interested in collaborating across their industries and sectors to reimagine what building a talent pipeline looks like. This can't just be, quote unquote, a talent grab. This can't be asking education to become a job training uh, vision for our country. Like, what does the collaboration of this really look like? Um, tactically, there's three things I can name. Um, we're going to be trying to do this through some um, partnerships that we have on the ground right now. One of them is through an existing school-based model. Some people may have heard of um, P-TECH. Um, and so we're going to be working with a number of IBM partnered P-TECH schools to really help these school models reimagine how they're operating in the context of systems and how they might be able to leverage new conversations about systems level change and scale because of the work that they're doing. We're going to be Ooh. working with in existing state systems, uh, for example, in the state of Delaware, we're going to be helping them think through and implement a model that's embedding apprenticeship um, at a fundamental level in their vocational high school system so that all students Ooh. are earning their first year of college credit before graduating high school in an earn and learn model. Uh, and we're also going to be doing this through a, a new national initiative that will be um, announced soon with a number of partner organizations to JFF, where we're going to be convening five really innovative, forward-thinking, cross-sector teams to um, stand back a little bit from the problems in front of them today and lift their gaze and engage in some problem finding rather than problem solving and really work with them to redefine the nature of the problems we think we're trying to solve and then partner with them and have them partner with each other to define really innovative next generation solutions that we feel can start to tackle some of these large intractable structures and policies that have created really durable inequities over, over generations. Um, and all of this for me adds up to a, a narrative change component. How do we compel current practitioners, folks on this call, um, but also my neighbors who are not engaged in this work actively mm -hmm. in a real mm -hmm. conversation about what is our public responsibility to young people, to our economies and our communities, as mm -hmm. we think about educational attainment and real readiness for launching a career in a, in a high quality job um, that has a career ladder and people can see themselves in relation to their future working self over over a lifetime. Oh, wow, wow, wow. wow. Um, well, thank you both. And here, I, I promised you I would show you some cool effects. So here's here's one yeah. cool effect right now. Um, this is a, this quite, a vision, quite a vision. And I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear about your upcoming announcement of a partnership at a national level. Um, friends, I'm going to turn the, uh, the mic over to all of you in just a minute. But I want to ask a couple of quick, quick clarifying questions just to get the ball rolling uh, even further. Uh, one is, you've described, I think, very well the role of, of uh, of secondary education, but what are some of the ways that you'd imagine colleges and universities changing to fit into the big blur? 
yeah, I think they would, I think they would absolutely have to um, change as a part of this vision. Brian, if we suggested it's only secondary schools, we probably haven't done our job. And, you know, I say this, like getting out on a limb here, um, I think they would have to connect much more systematically to the labor market needs than they do now. Um, and that's just one big change. And then I also think that um, they have to think of their, um, the intake of their, of their, um, their talent pipelines, if you will, like starting much sooner. So reaching back um, and providing uh, sort of integrated support uh, with um, secondary school educators uh, as well. But um, again, you know, this, this change, like sort of in Blurvana, if you will, you know, we're really talking about neither a high school nor a college, but a new kind of institution, an institutional form, um, just as a way in some ways to provoke kind of like just different kinds of thinking from uh, the archetype that we've had for so long uh, of high school, then you have college, then you go to a career. This would all be much more integrated because we think, you know, in part, one learns best when you're doing, uh, actually having some work experience as well and applying that learning. Um, anyway, so those are just a few answers. I don't know if Kyle has some other perspectives, he usually does. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it goes a little bit back to the, the provocation I put forward around, a, a, I think, a cultural and societal level conversation around public responsibility is, Ooh. you know, Ooh. right now, post-secondary education is very much a private good um, in, in our, in our uh, community, um, in, our, in our country where um, I mean, most working adults do not have uh, a post-secondary credential. Um, most high school kids actually don't attain one. Um, and so when we talk about post-secondary, it becomes a very isolated conversation and a very narrow conversation about who we're talking about when we talk about the young adults or adults in those systems. And so I think we have a moment where we can engage in a very public discourse about how do we transition from a private good uh, when we think mm -hmm. about a post-secondary credential into that being part of the public commitment that we have to supporting young people attaining uh, the careers that will allow them to take care of themselves and their families and contribute in meaningful ways. And so um, I don't know if that speaks to your question about how, do, how does post-secondary need to transform, but I think that all of these isolated institutions and systems need to transform concurrently so that we don't just create better band-aids across them or stronger you know, bridges, but how do we really merge them in a way that feels seamless to a young person moving through them, where they see that what is what they are doing is part of, um, is something that they're a part of and is not something that is being done to them. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's, that's, that's a really good start to the, uh, to the question. The, I, I had more questions, but people have already, they, they've already come out of the gate. Uh, and there's a, an observation from chat, and I may, I may mispronounce this. Uh, Charles Finley says that there's the Ru Institute at Northeastern, um, which I don't know. Uh, so he put a link to it in the chat, and I'll put a link right there right now. And I'll also tweet a link out, and I'll CC your uh, jobs for the future, too. Um, but uh, Charles, if you want to say a bit more about uh, about the connections you see there, you just you know, either type in the chat or type in the Q&A box, or you can join us on stage. We'd be, we'd be delighted to hear from you. Is that a familiar um, institution for you, for you gentlemen, to uh, respond to? No, I hope he says more because I would like to learn about it. Okay, we'll give him a chance. Um, now he's saying he's, he's been regretting that I've asked him to do this now, but we'll we'll see what he says. We have a couple other questions, uh, and again, the forum we have uh, we're all about this kind of conversation. Um, this is from uh, John Hollenbeck, and uh, John says, "Isn't the problem that they that they are three systems?" that they should be replaced by individualized learning opportunities focused on the professions that they're interested in. And I'll put that back up on the screen because that's a, that's, a, that's a deep question. John, John I mean, I, I could just, I would just say yes. <laughs> I mean, in some ways we're proposing, I mean, it, it's hard, like even for us, right? We're trying to push the thinking of the field, but then you get back to, like, I thought I saw someone chat in you know, oh, you're talking about grade progression again, you know, and like, you're like, yes, I know, you know, we should actually have a more seamless learning system. If we did it right, and we had that kind of infrastructure, um, you wouldn't need that kind of grade, you know, hard grade um, 
Carnegie unit, you know, whatever, whatever the units, right, the silos, um, those are things that just need to be busted. Um, but so I'll admit that there's, um, you know, sometimes um, uh, a little talking out of the both sides of our mouths here because we're kind of constrained by what we know as well, even yeah. as we're trying to su suggest something really different. But I would just that's a long way of saying emphatically agreeing that we need to we need to really merge those systems. Thank you. Thank you. If, if, if you're new to the forum, by the way, that's that's an example of a text question. Um, so you can and uh, so you can. Uh, Charles uh, Finley uh, answers very, very kindly. He says the Ruhr Institute, uh, Northeastern's Ruhr Institute, is designed to spur innovation, build talent and drive economic growth in Portland, the state of Maine and the Northeast partnerships with industry, academia and government. Uh, so, Charles, thank you. That sounds very, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank and, you. Uh, and I would just love to encourage folks, like when you, when ideas are sparked, you're like, oh, I've, I've heard of the Rowe Institute and, and you should take a look at that. We we need this kind of input because we wanna we wanna be able to size and catalog the field of innovation and, and who is making strong momentum at, in, even at local regional levels, because I don't wanna leave good learning mm -hmm. on the table um, or, or not harvest the right insights here. Um, you know, but when I hear even what I just heard about that in, in the brief remark, it's my question would be, and I haven't looked at it yet, is how do we help support efforts like that, better reaching back and building a system that begins possibly as early as middle grades, helping young people have this conversation with themselves about their career, but create a system that is uh, fluid enough to account for the fact that young people, um, they develop at, at different rates and they change their minds. Um, I'm I'm almost 50 and I'm kind of a hot mess and I don't know what I want to be when I grow up, you know, let alone my 13 year old son. Right. Um, but so how do we design for that reality, but all along the way, make sure that the opportunities transition to things like expectations so that those opportunities don't get not taken advantage of or not put in front of particular students for whatever reason. Mm, 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 mm. Good point. Good point. Uh, you have a fan, by the way, in the chat, Lisa Durf says we have to grow up. So you have a, you have a fan or a tri fellow tribe member. Um, and Don Lubach says he's almost 50 and he's a hot mess. You know, this is this is good. You, you, you know, lots of lots of fans here. Um, when, when you were speaking, Kyle, I was thinking this might connect to the Paradigm Project. And before I could finish that thought, the, the Paradigm Project's director and founder put in a question. So let me put that up on for everyone to see. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, the wonderful David Scobie. Uh, it says, I love the focus on education as something that empowers students instead of subjecting them to lock, lockstep ed. This seems in tension with focusing on the immediate labor market. Mm. I agree with that. I think that um, some of the best work that we've seen historically um, in, the, in the pathways field, and I, I don't remember if Joel mentioned this, that some of these ideas and this provocation was born out of a bit of our collective impatience about the slowness of the reforms that we've seen. And so people across the country and states, regions have done really good, strong work building these more coherent systems um, and not in traditional, you know, just trades, but really reimagining a whole variety of career clusters into in, into different professions. Um, and I and I lost sight of the question. Um, I'm so sorry. Can you? Oh, that again? No problem. No problem. Um, that you oh, know, there it is. There it is. That seems to be intentional with focusing on the immediate labor market. There it is. Thanks, David. Is um, I think that our experience to date has been partly about convening around what are the current unique needs, but also pushing industry and employers to be thinking about, and they are, frankly, thinking about the future needs of the workforce. And that even includes trying to imagine what is around the corner and the types of jobs and careers that don't even exist yet. Um, so there's the immediate needs and pressure points that industries across the country are facing as a result of the pandemic, uh, the, the current economy. Um, skills and competencies, but also I see this as a very future facing and fluid proposition so that how yeah. does a school or an institution or a design like this allow for evolution over time and not become fixed? And that is a little bit about my bias around focusing on the strategies and systems as opposed to the models or programs, which can become really stuck in time as opposed to outline what is the vision and what might it take to allow that to become true? and then allow that to change as needs emerge and look forward about the future labor market. Well, there's a, a quick question that comes up uh, from the chat from our awesome friend, Vanessa Vale, who just asks, what if the jobs have disappeared by the time students graduate? It's happened before. All the time. I mean, it's happening all the time in this dynamic economy. And 
Um, you know, I think I'm building on a point that Kyle was making. I would put it in my own words, um, however inarticulately, but it's, you know, we have to prepare young people for that future. Definitely. We're not talking about just preparing for a job, right? We're preparing, preparing um, young people for um, lifelong learning including being able to you know, like learning on the job, learning how to like you look, you interview employers. They want problem solvers. They want critical thinkers. They want people who can learn how to learn that metacognition. They don't always put it that way. Like they say, oh, we need soft skills. Uh, I actually think uh, there's an organization called America Succeeds. Give them a shout out. They, I think they've done a great job um, categorizing the durable skills that are needed kind of across the economy for for highly skilled work including you know if you really look at those um i like the word durable because no matter what you know jobs disappear or get created you can see the value um and the transferability of that learning and 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 how it can set young people up for success in their in a career and a career is going to be looks it lo already looks so much different than it did you know 30 years ago i'm a rarity i've been at jff for 20 years i mean you, you just don't see that anymore. You know, you see people changing jobs every couple mm -hmm. of years as well. So we do have to, I think it's a terrific comment and we're not suggesting here to just preparing for a job. But uh, on the other hand, I, I don't think our institutions do a great job preparing young people for at all for a career uh, much, uh, especially one that's like sort of grounded in some kind of experience, which is the best kind of learning. In the in the chat, by the way, my uh, my my multitasking Maven friend here, Michael Crawford, shares a link to the uh, durable skills page on America Succeeds, uh, so you can find that in the chat. Thank you, uh, Michael. Michael, who is also tweeting, live tweeting at top speed, so I'm I, I think he might not be a single person, but a collective, you know, something like the Borg. Um, you know, glad he's on our side. Um, we have we have more questions coming in. Uh, and, and I'm trying to arrange them so that they, they fit nicely. Um, our good friend and hardworking writer, uh, Tom Haynes, um, asks simply, how do we get away from a linear model of educational progress? By that, Tom, do you mean, how do we move away from the current structures that seem to suggest that you just move lockstep through quote unquote, a series of grades based on age levels? Is that sort of the spirit of your question? Uh, I'm, I'm just going to bring him up on stage. I'm not even going to ask him. I'm just going to pull up on stage right now. So, <laughs> so cold call, cold call. That's, that's right. Well, it's always good with a, with a very warm mind and warm heart like Tom's. Hello, Tom. Hey. So, I mean, the, what I was trying to point out there is that, you know, we've, we've, we've had a lot of these models for a while now. Uh, and uh, it's... Um, in terms of you know early college and, and dual credit and things like that but they you know and i understand not attacking the system directly but one of the problems with the current system is this conveyor belt mentality when it comes to students and that you lot you know kyle has also said in the in the chat you know we and, and john as well talking about age segregation when it comes to learning and things like that. It's really hard to generate learners who are critical thinkers, who feel like they have agency in the world if they only have one linear path laid out in front of them. Now that linear path may lead to different careers, but it's still a path. You choose a path and then you go that way. So these are all legacies of industrial education. And in a lot of ways, this doesn't make sense in a world where we have scattered digital information all over the place. We're going to be pulling in stuff. You don't have a career path, right? As you just said, you have career experiences. You jump around, you do a lot of different things. It's very unusual for people to be somewhere for 20 years or something like that. So how do we break that mold? I know what you're doing is trying to erase some of the fissures in that mold, but it's still accepting that general, you start at grade nine and end up at grade 14 or whatever, 11 or 14 or whatever arbitrary cutoff you want to make. So that's what I was trying to ask. I mean, I, I love the spirit of the question and, and I don't claim to be an expert in, in maybe the, the most satisfying response here, but here's what it gets me thinking about, which is mm -hmm. the balancing act of, uh, well, I'm just going to be, I'm just going to put it on the table. Like, here's what's coming to my mind that, 
the system is designed to move people forward in a very lockstep way. And what is also true is people quite literally move through their lives and from where they are to where they are not. And so for me, the crux of this, or one of the questions I have as we think about redesigning some of these systems or where we maybe miss the mark, even in, in great models like early college and some of these career pathway things is, um, do we have enough folks in those systems who are really thinking intentionally about how do we not just ask young people to have a series of experiences and, and ideally in, in the workplace, ideally getting paid for that work as they get older, but what are the structures and intentionality that we bring to helping them make meaning of those experiences so that they can start to activate different types of decision making? And mm -hmm. why I'm saying that is I feel like that is one of the ways that I think that we can break that linear lockstepness and that if you have an active mind sort of engaging in a conversation with themselves about what they are learning and what this says about what their best possible future might be in the ideal sense of that if they have the right adult supports around them and and conditions they can be asking the types of questions that can then shepherd them in different directions because they're learning how to quite fundamentally be curious and mm -hmm. i feel like it's an undervalued skill that is not one i believe that we can quite teach but through conditions over time, I think we can nurture people's ability to be curious and to really value curiosity as one way to figure out how I move from where I am to, to where I am not. Right. Well, my, my argument is that the, stru the structural system, the structure of the system tends to undermine curiosity as a concept. Mm -hmm. Because if you are an independent thinker, if you go far afield, the system punishes you. Uh, and uh, you don't make progress. Um, and you may be accumulating a lot of useful artifacts and, and of learning and of, you know, I, when in my class, I, I very intentionally have my students create a tangible artifact of the semester that they get to keep. And, and very few other, you know, very few others do that. And there's nothing in the system that encourages that. Uh, if anything, there are things that discourage it, but uh, that's another conversation entirely. But the, the point I'm trying to make here, though, is that if you go to explore, the system punishes you. You graduate late. If you change majors, you know, doesn't this just extend that down into the high school environment even more so? Because none of my kids, well, one of my kids kind of knows what he wants to do with his life. The other three, not so much. They're exploring, but they're in a situation where they're, you know, they're burning money exploring, which is a scary prospect, right? Because they're all at college at this point. Um, and I fully expect, and I want them to explore, but at the same time, the system doesn't reward that. Well, Tom, thank you. Um, yeah. And uh, and thank you for, for being a good sport about letting me beam you up on stage by surprise. Um, and, uh, uh, I kind of and, expect it almost. <laughs> no, I know. It's been, I've got you in my back pocket there. Um, if, again, friends, if, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of video call. And believe me, I, I, you can volunteer. I won't just ambush you. Uh, I just save that for Tom. Um, but, um, and, of course, we have more text questions coming up. Uh, also, in the chat, by the way, people have, have, have shared a few more links. Um, and so I've just reposted them a couple of times. Um, so if you want to find you know, follow up, follow up with some of these a little bit further, but we have more clarifying questions or questions of imagination where people are trying to see how this new institution, this new model could work. Um, this is one from Betsy Kells who says, how does this square with the physical infrastructure of schooling? As in how many kids, is it a place to meet their basic needs? I, I would say kids, by the way, I would say that's not just 11, what is today 11th to 12th grade, but also uh, some college students as well. Joel, yeah, I mean, I think that I, I think it's I think it's all on the table. I think it's a terrific um, question, Betsy. These can um, I don't know. I mean, what, one thing it makes me think of is uh, you know there are some colleges. I think Tom, our the previous uh, person who joined us on the stage, mentioned early college schools. You know, mm -hmm. um, now they're few and far between. At the end of the day, um, they're very successful. You know, some of them, which got me into this work because I said, that's a different kind of vision. Um, a lot of them are based on you know, high schools that are based on college campuses. And it's interesting, like sort of that um, sort of uh, uh, proximity or if you know, the word is not coming to me, but co-location, mm -hmm. you know, alone, alone, it changed the way that young people 
identified um, themselves with higher education. Mm. You know, they just, they saw people around them were just near peers, right? They're like, I'm here, I belong here. Um, they're getting some support from the high school, granted, but it just changed their outlook. Uh, and then you add, you know, you know, all the Carnegie units, right? Like part of it is um, to, get, to kind of harken back to an earlier part of the conversation as well. I think part of what this demonstrates is you can you can move students through faster. I know that's not totally the goal here, mm -hmm. um, but when you say, you know, in part what I point to that's powerful about that is, okay, fine, we march them through the system more quickly, right? But that they really, and, but, and, but what it demonstrates to people is sort of like, why do we have it set up where you have to wait, 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 you know, when young people can like ac accomplish much more, um, more sooner, more quickly with the support systems, they do need basic, you know, a lot of those successful schools have really good support systems. If they don't, they probably don't serve um, underserved populations um, very well anyway. So, um, you know, I think if you, if you kind of blow out those sort of examples and sort of say, what's really going on here? You can replicate it even if it's not an early college high school per se, but you can begin to uh, sort of uh, play with permutations of physical plant, you know, mm -hmm. basic need and support where that is provided. So I, I think it's a terrific question and uh, it is a line of questioning that we mean to open up with this big blur concept. So thank you. Um, thank you, Betsy, for the really great question. And, and again, I, I haven't said this enough, Kyle, Joel, thank you for, for answering these questions so, so richly. Um, I know you both wanted a lot of feedback, and I, I, think, you, I think you're getting some of that. Um, we have uh, uh, more questions are just bubbling up. And again, friends, if you want to join us on stage voluntarily, just click the raised hand button, and I'll be happy to bring you up. Uh, we have uh, one coming from uh, John Pellman, and let me just get this up for you all. This is concerning, are you suggesting that this new paradigm should have to make the goal of education to place people in jobs? Hmm. John, I think I won't mangle that, but, but, but you get the idea. Yeah. Is the goal yeah. of education to place people in jobs? No, I, I don't believe that that is uh, what we're saying. And I actually appreciate, appreciate the clarifier on there. And I think Joel focused on this a little bit ago is I think that there's a big difference between thinking about career preparation and career navigation as opposed to job training and job placement. I think that that is the unfortunate and frankly tragic legacy of our vocational system in this country, that it was a tracked system. Um, I don't know the last time anybody played the game of life. Uh, my daughter got mm -hmm. it for Christmas a year mm -hmm. or two ago and I sat down to play mm -hmm. with her. And the first question that that game asks you is, do you want to have a career or do you want to go to college? I was incredulous. And she got so frustrated with me. She's like, Dad, can you just play the game? And I was like, no, I, I refuse to play this game. Um, right. And so, but I do think that um, there, there are some few who go through their education and they pursue higher education and increasing levels of, of education uh, at, in, in terms of like, like the curiosities, right? Like how do we study the mysteries of the universe? And, and I am, I'm a fan of that as, as a novice. But most people go to college to have a career. For in some shape or form, even if it's not well formed. Um, a colleague of mine, John Furr in Illinois, um, he said one time, he's like, you know, college is a very expensive career exploration activity. And I feel like it really landed some of the complexity of this is if, if young people are arriving in a post-secondary space without having spent any time exploring um, things that they might be interested in doing uh, yeah. on the other side of their, their college experience, um, a lot of, and when I look at the student uh, debt crisis right now and how many young people do not finish those credentials. Um, so I don't think it's about, you know, education, the purpose of education becoming about uh, working on behalf of employers to put people in jobs, but people need work. And I feel like, how do we have an attention that serves the, the unique needs and accelerates and transforms inequitable outcomes at the individual level? But as we also think about the health of communities, and ultimately regional economies. Uh, people live and work in economies. And, and we, so we need yeah. employment in those places. And so I think that all of these things are really wrapped up into a singular conversation. And I think that our educational systems and our workforce system can do much better at having a real conversation about how they can work better on, on behalf of people. Um, and how do we design those systems so they protect people and not protect themselves? Um, hmm. And, and, in, and, and in saying that, I, I also, you know, I don't believe that this is a, a, a proposal around a silver bullet, um, but 
but I do think that there's silver buckshot here. Um, another colleague of mine, Amy Lloyd, used to say that, right? That like every idea is not necessarily a good one, but usually when we think we have one singular approach that will work for everybody, that's usually often not awesome either. Well, I love the idea of silver buckshot. I'm going to have to steal that uh, right away. But that's that's a great answer. Thank you. Thank you. And um, again, uh, John, thank you for the great question, uh, which matters to you. I, I, I guess professionally, it matters a great deal to you um, working at a charter. Uh, we have another question from our uh, redoubtable friend, Kiel Dunch. Uh, and Kiel um, asks this question about credentials. Uh, the education system's structural flaws are baked in by hiring that mandates degrees with prestige degrees given preference. This has to be addressed for the big blurs reforms to be possible. That's not a question, yeah. which is a recommendation. What, what do you think? Keel, I really I appreciate that point, uh, Brian, that Keel raised. Um, you know, as kind of adjacent to the big blur work, we actually you know, as Kyle sort of mentioned, we don't, we're not pressing this as the um, the silver bullet, right? Um, so, but it is it is a pretty. It feels like a vision that resonates with folks, pr precisely because it conjures the sort of things that I've seen people uh, write in the chat on the side, out of the side of my eye here. Early college, dual enrollment, they have some sort of experience with this um, already. Um, I think credentialing is a new space. Um, like short-term credentials that um, there's a big appetite right now for, I think, employer, we've done surveys about this, by the way. If you look at a, at, at a report called Degrees, um, Degrees at Risk, we Ooh. did a report recently with American Student Assistance, um, uh, ASA, they go by, and we Ooh. interviewed um, and surveyed Gen Z young people and employers. And there is a huge, as Kyle sort of alluded to, there's a huge appetite by youth right now. So they're questioning the college, the traditional route to like, okay, I got to get a BA. That's what my guidance counselor tells me. It's what my teachers and my parents are telling me. Is that the only way I can get a good career? Like, and, and also like, look at all that debt burden and what's going to be the return on investment. I don't even know what I want to be yet. So like, there are definitely questions on that side and sort of um, an appetite for different, uh, for alternatives. And employers are also saying, look, I don't, yeah, I believe I don't necessarily need BAs for this job. Um, so I'm willing to look at different programs and credentials. Uh, now the issue is, be, like, it's interesting because they said that, but on the flip side, they also said, employers said, but like, I don't understand enough about those programs to like, to like choose graduates of those versus those with a BA. Those would be, that's safer, you know, at the end of the day, because I don't know much about these other ones. And students kind of said the same thing. They were sort of like, well, I know employers will, you know, basically pick someone with a BA over, you know, someone who's gone done a short term credential. So I probably, even though I'm very interested in alternatives, I know ultimately the BA has probably got the currency. So it's a real, like, it's, it's really like, how do you change the systems and mindsets around that. And so anyway, another long answer to sort of say, we're going to have to kind of crack that code as part of the big blur. And also, how do you make these short term credentials kind of stack to make sure that it doesn't lead to something that is for one job, you know, which has been a theme of our conversation here. We want to make sure that we create permeable paths with no dead ends and people can keep learning, keep moving up. This is to me all about, you know, economic security and advancement ultimately for individuals. Well, thank you. And by the way, thank you, Kyle, for uh, tossing in the link to, uh, to the study. Um, the two of you are working just, just fantastically. Um, and, and thank you for the great question, by the way. This is, uh, um, there's a lot going on and we have Brian one more. Oh, please, Brian, can I just I just wanted to build on something Joel said, and, and maybe there's Absolutely. an undercurrent of this is I do think um, and Joe Fuller, who's at the uh, business school at Harvard, has done a lot of work and research on this around degree inflation. And, you know, Joel was talking about like like the B.A. is still trusted as sort of the proxy. But when you really unpack and unravel um, the B.A., it, it is used as a proxy for skills and competencies that are not necessarily true just because mm -hmm. you have a four year degree. Yeah. regardless of what institution it's from. Um, and so there's, a, to Joel's point, I think there's a real public conversation we have to have, not to suggest that higher degrees are not valuable. I think that they bring tremendous value to individuals, 
to um, intellectual discourse, to uh, contributing deeper expertise in fields. But when we overvalue it because it has an, uh, an institutional name or a certain number of letters after it and use that as a proxy for someone being able to know or do something, um, we're sort of belying the fact that competency is demonstrated and that it is often context specific. Um, and that some of those skills are not necessarily transferable as we look across sectors or across types of roles. And so how do we build in these systems that really do focus on that life-wide learningness of opportunities, whether in education or work, to help people learn in these informal and formal spaces and respect that people bring experience and competency from other contexts, including higher education, but not exclusive to that. You, you all are calling for a massive, massive redesign. Um, I, I think you said that at the start, and it's just great to see that you, you fleshed this out. This is not a, you don't have a solution in a box. You're, you're calling for something much more extensive and uh, much more visionary. Excellent, excellent. Uh, we have a question that came up earlier in the chat, and I, I wanted to just hoist it from the chat because it's, it's an important question. It ties into a few of the things that people have been uh, hinting at. Uh, this is from Patricia Suarez. Uh, I hope I have her name right. Uh, how does your plan tackle the societal inequities across race and class so that all students benefit from your new system of learning? Also, how do you think your system will align with professional careers, examples, medicine and law? So the first part is about social yeah. inequities and then the second is about certain professional careers. Kyle, which part do you want to take? <laughs> <laughs> these are big. These are big. These are big ones. They're the right, they're the right question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm happy. To, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to start a, a little bit on the first one. Um, I don't believe that any singular so solution can tackle the size and scope of the challenge we have with equity in access or outcomes when we think about opportunities for economic advancement or career success. However, I do believe that the beginning value proposition of this paper begins with calling that into question. Um, that this is not a proposition mm. that should be for a select few, but it's partly in response to the other efforts that we have been making continue to be slow. You know, when we think about the changes in uh, degree attainment, for instance, across racial and ethnic groups, they have overall increased, you know, let's say over the last decade, but the gaps between those racial groups attainment levels have remained durable over time. And so there's something that we're not doing, or there's something we're doing that's working very well to keep those gaps from narrowing, <laughs> or there's something we're not doing to, that is that is that is in the way of those, um, uh, you know, you know, getting getting thinner there. And so I think that this is about if we establish a vision for really sharp understanding about what is it that young people need to know and be able to do to enter the workforce successfully with a job that has a career ladder and an understanding of what it will take to advance more deeply into the labor market and uh, economic advancement. And then use that as a way to, to quite literally backwards map into the post-secondary credential space and the high school space, or in our conversation, uh, this blurry space, and have a real conversation about, well, what are the credentials we're offering? Are these the types of credentials that signal competency that people will need in today's or the future labor market? And if we can get really clear on those skills and, and competencies and knowledge sets, then we can have a conversation about how do we make sure that young people are being prepared beginning way back in elementary school to be successful at those opportunities. Because yeah, if we don't, um, w you know, how do we deal with the upstream challenges as much as we're addressing the downstream ones? And so if we want young people to be successful taking early college courses to get their the leg up on their first credential, that means we have a promise to keep in relation to making sure that they are prepared to access college level content sooner. And they're capable of that. Um, th that has been proven through data. But the question is, is have our systems aligned themselves to really ensure that, again, that's not an opportunity for some, but it's an expectation for all. And if we set it as an expectation, we have a commitment on our side as leaders to make sure that we are preparing young people to access that level of content and thinking and activity. At an equitable level, I mean, I, I can't help but think of the history of tracking and the history of vocational education in the U.S., which is yeah. often skewed uh, towards people poorer uh, socioeconomically. Uh, and if you're inviting a, a public discussion, the public can be the public outcome can be biased by race, by class, as well as by other fields. Um, I mean, I, I guess is there 
is there a mechanism that you would like to see in order to keep things honest? Or is there a, uh, would you like to cast this in a specifically, uh, say, uh, Ibram Kendi anti-racist way? Or is this something which you think, you know, say federal regulations would be able to balance? I, I've asked Patricia to, to join us to say more if she can. I don't know if she's still with us, but, um, but uh, why don't you give that away? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we really have to be attuned to this. It's, it's a really terrific question and it keeps it's it does keep me up at night a, a bit. Like, I don't think this is the end all be all single solution, you know, that that we're, is going to solve all the equity problems. In fact, if we don't do it well, it could exacerbate inequities, just like anything we, we do right without like really paying attention to the preparation support needs i mean like let, let's be real right like also the way employer biases um you know all of our implicit biases racial segregation i mean so i think in some ways even though as radical as this sounds let me just hark them back though which is what saying why we focused on this kind of grade 11 through 14 sphere space mm. is is in some ways if you reduce it down i mean i, I also uh, a lot of the most successful programs and schools that we've seen really figure out how to bridge these systems right now, such as they are, the separate systems. We're calling for a blending, right? But right now we have programs that bridge them. And they do really well by Black and, and Latino students and students from low-income backgrounds, because in part what they're doing is they are really um, uh, uh, addressing uh, the cracks in those systems through which so many of those students fall. Like, so if you just look at the stats of students who graduate high school and then they even they get accepted to college, how many don't show up? Is there like any little bureaucratic barrier or question that comes up, you know, piece of a form or whatever? It just throws them off because they don't, it's like, it's, it's, it's huge. Their families don't know how to deal with that. Um, and, um, you know, I think it's something like 20, like only 20 percent of, of low income. You know, it's like it's some astounding number who don't through, through the summer melt phenomenon don't show up and then forget about it. Like when they go in, like, can they make it through their first year? You know, and so many of the students who are underserved by our systems fall through the cracks then. And then let's talk about the dismal completion numbers. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're suggesting here is. We know from these programs and these bridging pro programs, and in some respects, what we did is to say, let's extrapolate from that. And one of the key themes was, why don't we just eliminate the need for those transitions? Let's just make it seamless. And that it's a bet in a way that we can, you know, we probably will create other cracks, you know, maybe, I don't know. But this one feels like an obvious one to fix and we know how to fix it. Well, thank you. That's a that's a great answer, Patricia. That's a great question. Uh, if if you want to add more, please uh, uh, please feel free. Oh, and uh, and she does. Uh, she appreciates your candor. Developing non biased systems is incredibly challenging. I think this is a topic for a future discussion. I completely agree, Patricia. Uh, it's one that we'll keep returning to. Uh, we have uh, another question that's come in from our friend Michael Meeks uh, down at uh, in Louisiana, and Michael asks. Many of my students simply do not commit the time and bandwidth to learn, uh, e.g. too long didn't read. Do you see technology solving this problem of knowing how much true effort goes into learning? Can you say more? Uh, I, that's not a hedge. It's, it's a genuine curiosity. But when the question around uh, technology solving the problem, uh, just curious what you mean by that. Yeah, Michael, if, you're, if your camera and mic are ready, I'd be happy to bring you on stage, or if you just want to add some more, either as a new question or as a chat, um, we'd be delighted to hear more. And while, while Michael's working on that, um, we only have five minutes left, uh, and I want to make sure that everybody gets their chance to, uh, to put in a question or a comment. Um, the chat is really rich. People are going full tilt, um, and... Uh, and that's good. And I would love for anyone in the chat, if you've got a point that you that you want to press on that we maybe haven't addressed enough, please let me know so I can I can bring that up. Um, you know, Brian, I, I can share. I know I don't know if we have the expansion. It's not something that we've tackled directly, but mm -hmm. I can share some thoughts that we've. Uh, I know that Joel and I have certainly talked about, and that JFF is thinking about in this space. Is I, again, I don't think that technology is a silver bullet here, and I think that sometimes mm -hmm. we overly bias 
it as a solution to a set of complex problems. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think often we need a constellation of technological and human solutions to fix the intractable ones that we see in front of us. Mm -hmm. But I do think that there are technological solutions that can grease the wheels of, of some of this blurring. For instance, as we think about the evolution or potential promise of digital wallets or blockchain technology to give people ownership back over their, their, their credentials and their skills and the validation of those rather than having to pay a bursar's office to get a copy of their transcript or if they can be employer validated. So th this can start to break down some of those silos that are, are pretty rigid. I think that uh, serious games and the advent of uh, mm -hmm. AR and VR technologies, again, should school just be kids at home with their AR goggles on? Probably not. But can we use those to enhance their experiences in the world around them as we think about uh, living and working in the world? Can we use them to enhance experiences in the school or workplace um, or to explore careers that are really not accessible to them where they live um, as an education and training and enhancement tool? And so I think that how do we put together the constellation of technologies that will allow us to do that? Um, in, in another context where we've talked about with folks about innovation and technology, a lot of times we get similar questions about like, what's the most innovative technology that will be really transformative? One of my pushes to be transparent is it might not be technology, it might be collaboration. Mm -hmm. When I think about the most innovative thing that the field can really do right now, it would be to collaborate. I think what we get a lot is coordination, um, but to really collaborate and decenter oneself or one's organization and put the mission or vision in the center of a conversation is real hard work, um, really hard work, if I was going to speak grammatically correctly. Um, and I think that that's sort of a really innovative thing that we can do right now. Uh, that's Those are great answers, both the specific examples, but also the, the question of rethinking this in terms of technology. Michael did have uh, a couple of examples. He mentioned uh, eye movement, uh, so tracking eye movement, tracking pupil dilation, and, and also AI um, for a couple of quick examples. Thanks, Michael, for following up on that. So there are specific technologies, um, and then they have to be embedded in practices. Um, I would love to learn more about that. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely worth thinking to. But we we have our last minute left, uh, and I, I would, if we had time, I was going to ask you too to riff on what a community would look like if it embraced your big blur and did that for say five or ten years. And I think in many ways, this past hour, you've been helping us get at that process. But a key thing is you don't have that, that formula. You want us to develop that formula or multiple formulas. Uh, and you want to start that conversation going. And I think you've done a great job of that. Uh, let, let me ask a, a, a more practical daily question, which is how can we keep up with the big blur and with you two? Uh, what's the best way to track all these upcoming projects and announcements? Well, our website is uh, www.jff.org, but also Kyle, uh, don't we have the Big Blur website as well? Is that we do? We, we have secured BigBlur.com. I don't know if it's live yet, but it will be soon. Uh, so that would be one way, um, and pretty shortly, actually, we you can access the paper online now and see related bodies of work that undergird some of this thinking and that are active right now in the field, and whether this is broader networks of folks who are tackling different components of this across the education and workforce space. Um, and we will have a new page going up pretty soon if you follow along and we'll, we'll get that up in the social channels, which will have um, additional um, publications that will be coming out over time, um, a draft policy framework that we've been working on to help really shape a conversation about how far are we really from these conditions um, and additional collateral uh, that'll sort of shape a little bit of a conversation about what is when employers talk about this, what are they, what are they bringing up and what are the questions that they're asking? Um, but ultimately would love to keep folks uh, engaged in this conversation. Well, I, I'm really, really grateful for the two of you for kicking off this conversation. Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful for everyone on the forum today for uh, pressing on this and developing it and thinking all together. That's what we best do. Like we said earlier, uh, Kyle, uh, I think in many ways the key is collaboration. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll thank come you, back. Brian. Thanks, and, everyone. Well, we look forward to seeing uh, where this goes next. Um, so but everyone, uh, but don't go yet, friends. Uh, we have to uh, uh, just point you to where things, where things are going uh, next. If you want to keep talking about this, Michael Crawford and I have been tweeting, but other people uh, can join in on this. Just go to the hashtag FTTE or follow me or, or, or uh, Shindig Events. Or if you want to talk about this on my blog, just head to brianalexander.org. 
Uh, if you'd like to go back into the past, and we've touched on some of these topics before, including gamification and technology, just go to tinyurl.com slash FDF archive. Uh, if you'd like to continue looking at other topics that we have, we have a whole bunch coming up in the next month. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us and you can see more. Um, and if you want to share some of your great thoughts and projects with me, just hit me up, send me a note so I can share it with the world. And in the meantime, thank you all for talking with us together today. I think it's just a great way of thinking through collaboratively the ideas that uh, our, our authors have proposed in the Big Blur. Uh, I hope all of your fall semesters are going well. Above all, I hope you're all safe, and we'll see you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye.